Hello Planeteers, my name is Tavis Mbata. I am a candidate natural scientist and I studied Bachelor of Science in Agriculture degree at the University of Zululand. This talk is titled Plants in Photosynthesis, the Green of Our Green Planet, and I hope you will enjoy it. So a brief recap on what you've learned so far from the previous talk. We learned the importance of states of matter, specifically for liquid water, and gases water vapor which keeps the earth warm due to its greenhouse effects. We've also learned about the hydrological cycle and how water is recycled and we'll always have the same amount of water on earth. And we also learned about hydrogen bonding and the importance of the unique uh, molecular structure of water as it will also be important in photosynthesis. So this is our hierarchy of models and it places our talk at the fifth level which we will look at the components of life and how human life would not exist without plants, sun, and water. So briefly, I'll introduce wonderful plants to you guys and seek to explain what they are and how a typical plant looks like and also how plants came to be. Next, I will break down the details of photosynthesis, which will lead us to the role of oxygen on Earth, as evidenced by band ion formations. So I hope you guys are ready to go. So I'm sure at some point in your childhood, you may ask yourself what's so special about plants and why are they everywhere? Well, plants are intelligent organisms which have numerous chemical compounds and they possess the ability to communicate, sense the environment, defend themselves or as well as feed themselves using sunlight, carbon dioxide and water. And likely for us, they make oxygen as a byproduct from that. So in this talk, we'll explore how mammals such as ourselves would not be able to live on Earth without these underrated but sustaining plants. We'll also examine the adaptive capabilities of these wonderful plants. And lastly, look at the plants that we have in our biodiverse country. Okay, so what are plants? Well, plants are eukaryotes. So a eukaryote is a cell that has a mitochondria, which is like a mini SCOM inside. So this mitochondria is responsible for the energy generation in the particular cell. So plants have a lot of SCOMs. Hmm. <laughs> Autotrophs are organisms that have the ability to make their own food. So plants are photoautotrophs in that they use light to make their own food. Heterotrophs are organisms such as animals, which includes us, and fungi, which cannot make their own food, so they need carbon and energy sources from other organisms. Now this will be more eluded on in the next talk on food webs. And one of the most important things about plants is that they are producers of oxygen gas, which is like petrol for us humans. So this is plant morphology. Morphology means how an organism is formed. So in this situation, it's how a plant is formed. So we see here that on the right hand side of the image, there is a root system, which is below the soil, and a shoot system, which is above the soil. So we are more interested with the area of photosynthesis, which is almost always the leaves. So have you ever asked yourself, why do we not breathe nitrogen as humans? I mean, if you look at the atmospheric composition, nitrogen is 78%, while oxygen is just 21%. So that's weird, right? So, I don't know, did you guys know that there was a time on Earth when there was no oxygen on Earth? Huh. So let's find out what happened. So in this graph that we can see right here, on the x-axis we have time in millions of years ago, going from on the right hand side 500 million years ago, to the left hand side 4500 million years ago. And on the y-axis we have atmospheric composition from 0 to 80 percent so moving from the past and more towards the future that is left to right we see that there was a gradual increase in nitrogen coupled with a decrease in carbon dioxide 
and a decrease in hydrogen. Well, from about 2,000 million years ago or 2 billion years ago, there was an increase of oxygen. Now, at that period of 200 or 2,000 million years ago or 2 billion years ago, there was the predecessor of the modern cyanobacteria, which evolved to release oxygen into the oceans at the time. Now, when this happened, the oxygen in the oceans eventually got saturated and got to a point where it released into the atmosphere. Now this allowed for the formation of the ozone layer, which protects us from the harmful UV rays. And it also allowed for life to move from oceans to land. Sadly, it also killed a lot of anaerobic creatures. Now these are creatures that don't need oxygen to survive. Now banded iron formations. These are rocks that basically prove to us that there used to be a time where there was no oxygen on Earth. Stromatolites are also types of rocks, sedimentary rocks, that were formed by cyanobacteria billions of years ago. And these sedimentary rocks, um, along with banded iron formations, have stood the test of times. And as we'll see in the next slide, they were able to prove to us that there was a time when there was no oxygen and there was a time when there was oxygen in the mineral deposits. So this is how a typical banded eye information looks like. Almost like my shirt, how did I notice? <laughs> so the red layers on this rock uh, what is known as jasper, which is a form of silica with iron as well, while the duller or browner areas are magnetite. Now this um, reaction between oxygen and iron occurred in oceans until oxygen was outgassed into the atmosphere, into the composition that we have today. So this um, graph right here basically summarizes the oxygenation event, the great oxygenation event. So looking at the x-axis, on top there we have time. If you're on the left, more in the past, towards the right, you're coming towards the future. You're coming towards the present, sorry. And then underneath that, you have the numbers in millions of years ago. And then below that, we have the colored lines which show us the beginning and end of various organisms and formations. And at the bottom there, we can see on the y-axis, atmospheric, present atmospheric levels. 100% is what we have, is what oxygen is today, compared to what it was in the past. So you remember I said oxygen is 21% in the atmosphere. But in this graph, we are comparing the past with the present. So oxygen has to be 100%. So as you can see, in the past, there was a time where oxygen was less than 0.001%. And then the great oxygenation event occurred. And there was a jump in oxygen. So this is when the cyanobacteria was releasing oxygen into the oceans and then into the atmosphere. So plant evolution. The, this particular image shows us the evolutionary pathway of ancestral photosynthetic eukaryote cells. So billions of years ago, mitochondria and chloroplasts were free living organisms or prokaryotes. Now these prokaryotes were similar to cyanobacteria. So eukaryotes had mitochondrial duplication, um, the replication of the ESCOMs. And it, it was similar to other prokaryotes. Now the reason for this evolutionary drive, according to scientists, is that prokaryotes were anaerobic. So the prokaryotes, much like cyanobacteria, did not need oxygen. So once cyanobacteria started producing oxygen, everything changed. Everything changed. This evolved cyanobacteria started utilizing oxygen in water 
as an electron donor due to the abundance of water in the atmosphere. And this allowed for an increase in oxygen concentration. Now this environment led to the evolution of eukaryotes as larger anaerobic prokaryotes started to engulf the smaller prokaryotes, smaller aerobic prokaryotes. So looking at the image, the arrow is time from left to right, from the past towards more in the future or more towards the present. And as you can see, there's a time where mitochondria and plastid is engulfed by the cell. Now this gave rise to the first ancestral photosynthetic eukaryotes, while underneath, since there was no mitochondria and plastid or chloroplast, this was the ancestral heterotrophic eukaryotes. Sticking with plant evolution, this particular table shows the errors on the left column, the time in millions of years on the middle column, and the important events that occurred in that period on the right column. So I want to quickly draw your attention to three events that occurred in three various eras. So that is the evolution of simple multicellular organisms, which happened in the Precambrian era. And that happened 700 million years ago, while the colonization of land by plants occurred in the Paleozoic era 420 million years ago. And the um, presence of first flowering plants occurred in the Mesozoic era 141 million years ago. So photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is made up of two words, photo meaning light, synthesis meaning to make. So this is how plants use light energy from the sun to make their own food. So this equation basically summarizes what photosynthesis is. It is when plants take up carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight to produce glucose or plant food and oxygen, which we breathe in. So this is important because of the gas exchange that happens, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the release of oxygen into the atmosphere. Other important factors in this um, process are ATP or adenosine triphosphate and NADPH, reduced nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. These are important because they are energy carriers and they allow for the process of photosynthesis to be active. Now the morphology of photosynthesis is asking us where does photosynthesis occur. Now all green plants can photosynthesize and this usually is in the leaves. This photosynthesis occurs in the middle layer of the leaf tissue. Now, if my hand is a plant or a leaf, the middle area that we're talking about is the side of the leaf. That is where photosynthesis occurs. And that is called the mesophyll. Now, small openings in the leaf surface are called stomata. And these allow for the gases exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Now, each mesophyll cell contains organelles called chloroplasts, which are specifically for photosynthetic reactions. Within each chloroplast are dust-like structures called thylakoloids, which are arranged in stacks known as grana. So the fluids filled space in between um, these uh, grana are called stroma. The thylakoloid membrane contains green colored pigments called chlorophyll. That absorb red lights and blue lights but reflect green lights which give plants their typical green color. Now to get a bit more technical uh, into what happens in photosynthesis it's important to know that photosynthesis is made up of two different processes the light independent reaction as well as the Kelvin cycle. 
Now, the light independent reaction requires sunlight, as it mentions, and that is when the sunlight is used to hydrolyze or to split the water molecule of H2O into O, while the H is used by the energy carriers of ATP and NADPH in the conversion or the um, it's the conversion of carbon dioxide into glucose. Now as this carbon dioxide gets into the chloroplast cell or the chloroplast organelle, it is converted into a carbon molecule which is called glycerol aldehyde 3 phosphate or G3P. This G3P eventually becomes glucose, which is the plant food that the plant needs for its various activities. While oxygen is released into the atmosphere, and this particular reaction occurs for as long as the plant is alive, basically. And when this reaction stops, the plant dies. So, do all plants make food in the same way? The short answer is no. This particular table shows us or explains to us the um, metabolism of plants. Basically, it's how they are able to continue photosynthesizing in different environments. So, most plants, about 85%, are C3 plants. That is, they contain three carbon compounds or they produce three carbon compounds. These plants are trees, rice, wheat, and soybean. And then they are adapted for cool, wet environments, while vascular plants are C4 plants. Now, these are plants such as sugarcane, maize, crabgrass. They are adapted to more hotter environments. While at the bottom there, we have Crassulian acid metabolism, or CAM plants which are like cacti which we find in deserts and pineapples now these are adapted for more drier conditions now this could also tell us that plants have been adapting or are actively adapting to prepare for drier conditions that are accompanying this current climate change that we're going through so the cape floristic kingdom is one of six uh, flora kingdom which is also one of six kingdoms of life this k flourish kingdom is what makes south africa a special place in terms of plants as the fame boss is so rich in plants that about 80 percent of all plants in the k flourish kingdom come from the fame boss bio also very special about south africa we have what we call pork bush or elephant food which is one of the most efficient carbon sink uh, sequesters in the world. According to scientists, um, a thicket of Portulucaria afra is more effective than the Amazon rainforest at removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this plant is indigenous to the Eastern Cape province. So in conclusion, we've learned that plants are essential for the production of oxygen and food. Um, we've learned that photosynthesis converts light energy to chemical energy. Basically, guys, we're eating sunlight. And we've learned that banded ion formations are evidence that there was a time on Earth when there was no oxygen. And there was oxygen. And this was due to cyanobacteria. So next up, we have biodiversity and food webs, which is the last step in making the Earth habitable. So as we can see here on the left, we have cyanobacteria and on the right image is Portucaria afra. Just to remind you about the relationship between oxygen and carbon dioxide. So please stay tuned for more and all the best for the rest of the course.